Yes. We've got to make sure. We did a lot of cool web stuff. I mean, I know that we're going to be using Screencast-O-Matic. Yeah. You had, I mean, I've got that voice memo. Well, we set before. up the blog, of course, where we, where we pretty much could display all, all things that we were doing through various platforms. And, you know, on there, we had links to, you know, the Google Docs yeah, that my yeah. class was working on. You used Audacity to trade some MP3s with us. Of course, we used GarageBand to throw some MP3s back to you guys. I really, I mean, is Blogger, is that too obvious? Or we should, I mean, we should talk about that, though. Definitely. Yeah, I think I think maybe that's where we start. We start with Blogger. There was our, you've got the, you've got the screen cap for the Skype, right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, let's let's start there with Blogger. So we set up this blog, right, for, for three schools. Uh, Green Hill, Hockaday, and uh, Oak Ridge to get together and share demonstrations of student learning. It's, but, Jared, I guess we have to be honest, that's not really where it began, right? Well, should we go back further? Introduce yourself. Okay, all right. Hi, I'm, I'm Jared Colley, Chair of the English Department, Oak Ridge School, Arlington, Texas. My name's Joel Garza, I'm in the upper school at Green Hill in Addison, Texas. So, I guess to really tell the real story, we've got to go back to a totally different idea. An idea that I was cooking up, isolated, over at Oak Ridge. Hadn't met you yet. Hadn't met really anybody in the community. I'd just moved down from New York. Um, and so I had this idea. I think we could probably call it a traditional idea. I think so. Yeah. I was thinking about the fact that I go to these sports games, I see these athletic teams from various schools, they get together and they demonstrate their talents and they challenge each other and as a result everybody rises to a higher occasion. And I kind of realized that's collaboration between departments at different schools. And sure. why don't English classes do that? And so it got me thinking, what about establishing a conference or planning a conference where students could get together, students who perhaps maybe read the same book at different campuses, could share papers, have workshops, exchange their ideas, challenge each other, and as a result, we could have a really fruitful collaboration in our community. And so I figured, why not send out an email to various English departments and see what kind of feedback I get? And so I guess we begin there, right? That was certainly the way that I heard about it, was through an email that you sent. Now, how did you come to construct the call for papers? Well, so the first thing I did is I kind of obnoxiously data mined a bunch of emails of various English departments to get different English teachers' emails, and without their permission, without them even knowing me, I was just going to, you know, send them a message and say, hey, let's get together and plan a conference. And honestly, I didn't really know what to expect from that. But I think I framed it in some way like this. I haven't got a call for papers yet. Just seeing what the interest is. So what if we organized an interinstitutional paper colloquium for high school students? One, we could model higher academic scholarship. Two, we could provide an opportunity to practice public speaking. And three, we could provide real audiences for student writing. And of course, getting back to the original idea, this facilitates collaboration among different English departments at different campuses. And if I remember correctly, I gave you the tersest of replies at that point, <laughs> right? Let me know when you get something more, but I offered you no help at that point. Did you get, did you get help from other people? Well, yeah, you know, a shout out to Deborah Moreland, actually, over at the Hockaday School, who is not here with us today, but she was awesome. I get a response from Deborah, and boy, was it a response. She asked me, well, what would these prompts look like? What would be the point of these papers? Are we going to have them do research? Or are these just going to be close readings? And before I knew it, I had all these questions, deep questions about pedagogy, sitting in my lap. And I really didn't know what to do with them. And so before you knew it, Deborah and I were in an email tennis match, back and forth, discussing pedagogy. It went well beyond the idea of planning a conference. And one thing that struck me there, now that I look back, is we started collaborating at that moment. Did you feel like at that point you were losing control of it in any way. I mean, here's this person, I mean, granted, you data mined her email address, <laughs> right? But here's this person who's making all sorts of rigorous philosophical critiques of your plan. Right, right. How did you feel working through that? Yeah, you know, I mean, it definitely was dialectical. And, and one aspect of dialectics is, 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 is 
it's it's threatening, right? You know, someone's challenging you to think even better, right? Right. Someone's challenging you to think differently than you normally think. So you arrive at this traditional call for papers, right? That's fueled by this dialogue with Deborah, and what was born out of that was a call for papers that was so much better. And at this level here. You can see the call for papers. It looks very traditional. It looks like something that you might see posted up in a department on any college or university campus. At this point, still a very traditional idea. Oh, well, I think at this point, we, we get back to your email, right? And uh, perhaps we talk a little more about that, that, that so-called terse email you sent me. Let me tell you, this collaboration from my part, I did not know about the collaboration that Jared had already set up with Deborah. So you didn't know that we were emailing like this? No idea, and I don't even know if you would have thought of it as a collaboration at that point. But for me, I entered because of my professional jealousy, right? So I see <laughs> this call for papers, and I think, Dubliners is a great text. This is framed in an interesting way. Now, I don't know that the framing involved multiple people, but it was framed in an interesting way. And that was the product of collaboration? Absolutely. This would get my students to stop writing in a stagey, weird, awkward way. They would have an authentic audience that they would be butting heads with. I hate this Jared Colley guy, right? That's what I'm thinking, right? When I thought of, I wish I had thought of the idea first. So. I tucked that email of yours away <laughs> into this monster appointment. And I thought you were ignoring me. Well, I'm sorry, but yeah, <laughs> it was only because I envied and hated you. This professional envy got me to think a lot and dream a lot for the entire spring of that year, but I kept it all to myself. And I, I gotta tell you, this tucking away, this emotional envy was a really interesting part of collaboration and you know for me what what was really shocking was that it awakened an uncertainty and a vulnerability that I didn't know was there you know, right I wasn't sure that I was as good a teacher as this Jared Colley person I wasn't sure that my students were ready to exchange arguments with mm their classmates across the independent school world in our Metroplex. So, in looking back, this was one really interesting discovery that I had, not just about myself, but about any time that I was frustrated at a colleague for not working with me, mm. standing in the way of successful collaboration in my experience is a tremendous amount of ungrounded fear and anxiety mm. that we don't even want to name. So for that reason, I didn't reach out to any of my other colleagues that you had emailed. <laughs> I didn't order the book for my students. And it took me months to offer you the reply that you deserved. Can, can I walk through that reply real quick? Go for it, yeah. yeah I, I love this email. Yeah, so September <laughs> 17th, six months later, <laughs> Hello, this is Joel Garza. Thanks again for hosting this colloquium. I'm beginning a short story unit with my AP students right now, for which they'll read several stories from Dubliners. So up until this point, you don't know that Green Hill is involved. And I guess I, guess I should say, the colloquium we were planning was on James Joyce's Dubliners. I'm not sure we've said that. I don't think so. And, and so, again, back to your email. We will be reading several stories from Dubliners. Would you, or any of your colleagues, be interested in the Skype conversation? or trading of MP3s on the subject of these stories. I thought such an exchange might give students a hint of the kind of fun a colloquium might be. Hopefully I'll throw a few submissions your way. Thanks! Exclamation point, lowercase j. <laughs> Holy cow. Light bulb moment. I was thinking of this collaboration that we're going to be having in, in you know, the near future months once we finally get these papers in and the kids get to meet on, this, on the Oak Ridge campus and exchange their ideas. But for the next six months, I'm just going to twiddle my thumbs <laughs> in a giddy state of anticipation, but we'll get to collaborate one day. Well, but that's the way that these colloquia work. You I send know, out a call yeah. for papers 
and you've just got to wait. And, and sometimes you... it's a year. Yeah. I mean, when you, especially on the professional level, right? right? You send in a proposal and it's not happening for a year. And so when you sent that email, it was just like light bulb. It was like a brick hit me in the head and I woke up and I was like, why aren't we collaborating now? And looking back at the email, so you're excited Looking back at the email again, I recognize all sorts of cute little stylistic <laughs> tips where I'm trying to build some sort of intimacy or friendship with you, right? So for me, I moved from professional envy to within a single email, collaborator. Right. We had we had bridged some sort of let me back up. I had gotten over that envy, realizing this could be fun. Well, and this is that moment for me where I came out of the Luddite cave of traditional academia and realized, exactly as you're describing, we had made the first step necessary to collaborate now. We had built trust. We fueled each other's energy. I remember numerous emails <laughs> within a couple of days. And I guess for me, what to speak emotionally again, I became worried that I was steamrolling over you. I kept having, you know, idea after idea. How about we do this? How about we do this? And let me say, this is the second stage of my professional envy moment, which was, can oh, wait, I read? Wait, 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 you were envious. Well, yeah, yeah, well, let me, let me explain, because then you send an email, right, asking, hey, how do you feel if I contact some of the other teachers that you've reached out to okay. about this conference? Do you remember this? Uh, yes, yes. And I think, I think uh, of course, shout out to Deborah over at Hockaday one more time. Deborah responds to your query about Skyping and collaborating now. And I think the reason that you reached out to other English teachers is at the time – our classes didn't quite match up yes. with the same schedules, and we were still thinking real-time Skyping. And so we kind of put the idea on hold, and you reached out to other teachers. And when so, yeah. Deborah got back to me, our schedules did not align either, but I realized she's down the street. Right. I can go and meet you in person. Get in your car. Right. My visit to Hockaday was not Jared's idea. It was not her idea. It was my idea. I invited myself. Yeah, so let me read another email I get from you. Is okay. that okay? Please. Okay, so this is September 20th. Hey Jared, hope your Thursday's been good to you. I just wanted you to know about a cool development. Hockaday's Deborah Moreland shared my Google Doc with her class, and that energized them so much that we exchanged some emails. Here's what we decided on. She will host me in person, exclamation point, in her class <laughs> on Tuesday, the 25th. On that morning, I'm bringing to her students two questions designed by my students the previous day. At the end of that Tuesday class, I will bring from her students two questions designed for my students. We will answer those questions on Thursday, the 27th, record our responses as a sound file, and email the file to both Hockaday and you. Maybe we can figure out more visits in person. I'll let you know how it goes. Dot, 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 dash, well. Now, the jealousy <laughs> that I felt when I read that email. Yes. Maybe this was the moment where I felt the uncomfortable loss of control. Because I had this idea, and I had taken the risk to send it out, and, you know, I had had this energized dialogue with Deborah. We've made this call for papers, and now I'm being left out. <laughs> this was the moment in my envy, in my moment of jealousy, where we really embraced the digital sphere. Because I realized, wait, I want to eavesdrop on these visits. I want to know what Howell does over at Hockaday. And I can't wait for this MP3 file he's going to be mailing us at some point, right? So... At that point, I think I send out an email to both of you saying, how do you guys feel if I set up a blog spot? Mm -hmm. We'll call it dubliners2013.blogspot.com. And so, we set this up. Had you ever set up a blog before? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. And we, we used it for all sorts of things. I think in the beginning, and I love the, the if you go look at the blog, you'll notice 
it starts off with teachers posting. Yes. Right? So like, hey, here's a great resource. Here's a free version of Dubliners. Here's a MP3 of James Joyce reading Finnegan's Wake. Or, it, you know, we were exchanging all these links, it teacherly be, links. It began more of, it began as more of a bulletin board. Right, right. And you blogged about your visit to Deborah's class. Deborah blogged about her perspective of the visit. But at some point, the students really took the reins. Let's and talk about the student engagement. Though. Sure, yeah. You know, email, it kind of described one method that was employed where Green Hill students posed questions for Hockaday students. Hockaday students posed questions back that were born out of those questions posed by the Green Hill students. You guys sent us your responses through an, an MP3. We pose questions back through our MP3. And so I saw students doing the exact same thing we as teachers had started to do, where they were framing things differently for each other. On an even more subtle level, let me tell you one thing that happened in my class. It was something very simple. There was a student in my class who made a point about diction in Dubliners A Little Cloud. Right, I remember this, yes. There was a word yes. choice that one of my students pointed out, and one of your students, so politely, so directly, so simply, mentioned that student by name and said, thank you, I agree about the effect of that word choice. Right. You should have seen the Green Hill students light up <laughs> proudly, <laughs> That's awesome. looking over at her. That cool? And we served that excitement for days, knowing that each of us in the room had an authentic audience right. off campus. I even thought about, after this experience, how when students only write for their teacher, you're writing for this single person, and they're, they're the only one that's going to read it. Why make it great? You right. know? Why spend too much time on it? Why think too much on it, you know? But if you know you're writing for others, a community, right, and they're going to appreciate it, like that student expressed. Boy, it's empowering. Now I think might be a good time to give you all a look at what the Dubliners colloquium looked like when we all actually got right. in the same room. Let's check it out. And so, of course, we did it again. Should we tell them about it? Let's go again. Yeah, okay. Right. A week later, I emailed you guys and said, shall we do another text? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that's around the time that all that news, uh, the news stories about Richard III's body, I suggested, let's, let's do Shakespeare's history play. Let's, let's all read Richard III. We knew at least that the three of us wanted to work together again. Right. We knew that there would be... There would be a blog that could host everything. For Richard III, we had, instead of an ad hoc collaboration, we decided from the beginning, let's model different schools of thought, each one of us. So when I came to this collaboration that we had set up, I said, let me be the Shakespeare and performance guy. So right. when I come to your classes, I am going to construct a project for each of your students cut 25 lines from this speech. Such a cool project, by the way. I remember when you came in and you pushed my kids to think this way. 
One thing I saw that was born out of that is they really understood the importance of each character's role all the better once they had to discuss the pros and cons of cutting a character's lines. To see them on the blog disagree with one another. Right. You can't cut those lines from Buckingham. <laughs> those are essential. You know, cut the you know cut cut the queen some more, <laughs> and then somebody would speak up and say, "No, you can't do that. Course, how no. dare? Right? She's one of the few female I characters know. in this thing. And they get sidelined the whole time. Yeah. How are we going to sideline them more? Yeah. We knew from the beginning. Okay." Hoel is going to be the Shakespeare and performance guy. I think I was maybe the history guy. Yes, yes. And my students knew if they had a historical question, let's pitch that to Mr. Colley. Right. We got to act one of Richard III and start this play. We taught Deborah's notes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right, right. She just sent over her notes. And, and I, it was really cool for my students to see how transparent I was with it. Right. No, I would say this is Deborah's question yeah. for us. I noticed she was kind of the moral questions person, right? Like she had a lot of ethical and moral questions she wanted us to wrestle with. We, every now and then in the room, your names would come up. Right. What would Mr. Colley say about this? <laughs> what would the Hockaday students, what do you think they're making of this right. passage right here? Well, and same over at Oak Ridge. We taught your notes for act two. And I think everybody taught my notes for act three. And that gave fruit to something that we did not expect to happen in the papers. Right. They began to take very seriously, in the writing process, right. the well, opinions of their classmates on other campuses. Well, well, check out your student's paper. I think his name was Sam. I mean, bam, he just starts. Dr. Moreland noted in our discussion of Richard III that Richard has trouble understanding women. He just drops her name right there. I mean, this is evidence of students who know their audience. They're connecting word to audience. It's meaningful, real writing. You know, another thing that I thought was really cool, not only were the students addressing the other teachers, using their ideas, they were using other students' ideas. They were referencing each other. I mean, I have a student's paper right here where she's citing a student over at Hockaday, one of my Oak Ridge students is citing a Hockaday student from her blog posting. Not only are these students connecting their word to real audience and empowering each other in the process by doing so, they were learning digital literacy, like how to legitimately cite a blog and how to incorporate that into a so-called traditional formal paper. And as a result, those formal papers were all the better. And students knew how to, back to the emotional level, that. We as adults had such trouble with in the beginning. <laughs> right. They understood that there was nothing more compassionate than to demonstrate that I have listened to you, right. I have thought, and I respect you enough to ask you this clarifying question. So for me, this whole thing starts with this private simmering envy. <laughs> and it winds up as this bit of shared fun. So I think as an English teacher in terms of these narrative arcs, right? right? So for me, here's the educational arc from isolation and anxiety to community and joy, right? I mean, that, perhaps for you also, that's an ideal emotional arc. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't think of a better way to state it. And I got to say, it shouldn't end here. We have no. to keep doing these. Yeah, I mean, definitely. just like that light bulb moment when you just hit me with that email. Why aren't we collaborating now? Like the trust has been established and we're sharing this story with other people because we want to collaborate with other people. We want to keep seeing these things happen. Thank you very much for listening. This is our contact info. Once again, I'm Hoel Garza, upper school English instructor at Green Hill School. I'm Jared Colley, chair of the English department over at the Oak Ridge School. There's our URLs for the blogs that we employed. Surf around, check them out. Get in touch. We'd like to collaborate more. Peace. Thank you. Mm -hmm.